you may be aware. So this is the same as B, A, C, for instance, and so on. Uh, two sets are identical if they have the same members. And uh, also, listing members multiple times doesn't change anything. So the sets containing A, A, B, A, C is the same as the sets containing A, B, C, right? Um, and then, then we have the empty set, which is just this contains nothing. And um, yeah, and we write things like A is an element of ABC. It's in there, and of course, B is not an element of ABC, right? So far, so good. So basic notation. We can um, define sets in these three ways that I listed here on the, on the um, handout. Uh, and just quickly to go through this, uh, for example, here I used the first of these methods, just telling you which of these, uh, which members, which things are in there and which are not. Uh, in general, this isn't possible because sometimes set are, sets are infinite or we don't like, even know who's in there. For example, the set of all Japanese men, you know, none, none, none of us knows who is in there, but um, there are ways of defining this. So here we have the first method, the enumeration, and on the handout you see for the set of odd numbers, the same uh, basic idea, but you have these dot, dot, dot uh, notations to show, as uh, well, to deal with infinity, right? Um, another common way of doing it is with variables. So the set of odd numbers is the set of things x such that, and then there is some clause, some statement that uh, tells you what it takes to be a member of the set, right? Uh, in this case, I say now positive odd numbers, where it is greater than zero, and what? Um, not divisible by two, right? Well, right, and um, so x is a variable here, bound by basically this bar, if you will, right? Something like that. Um, <clears throat> and so it tells you for each object, whether it's in there or not. Uh, third, you can have these inductive clauses. Um, you start, you say, for this only works if you have a set that has a certain internal structure. But the languages that we'll be dealing with, the formal languages have, of course, such an internal structure. So the third way of defining sets is important to see how this works. Uh, you have three clauses here. One is in the set because it's a positive odd number. And then you have this conditional clause, which tells you if x is in the set, then x plus 2 is also in there. Did I say x plus 1 here? I'm sorry. This, this should be 2, of course. I'm sorry. We are only talking about odd numbers here. So the second clause then says, well, since you started out with one, right, you have the set it contains one that we know, and then since one is in there, so is three, and now since three is in there, it applies again, and so is five, and this goes on forever, because you can go forever listing these things, right? So it makes sure that it captures all the members of the set. But we could not write them. And of course, you have to say that nothing else is in the set because the first two clauses don't rule out two, for instance, right? Could be in there. These things are still be true. Okay. Um, so these things I already mentioned in two, one, three. Things to keep in mind. Mm, in um, this third point perhaps is important that sets may contain sets, but um, we 
we'll skip over that because it's not, it doesn't show up in our immediate concerns. So things we'll do next. Okay, relations. So we have relations between sets and operations on sets. And relations between sets are, for instance, the subset relation. I have to keep this with me. The subset relation. So it's an expression like this is a statement that can be true or false of these two sets, x and y. And it is true just in case all the members of x are also members of y. So another way of drawing sets graphically is with these diagrams, right? So for instance here, x and y, you have these members and x is a subset of y in this case. y is not a subset of x because there are things in y that are not in x. Okay. Um, so this means x is at most as it has at most all the members of y, maybe fewer. If you want to rule out the um, uh, case that they are equal, you would say that x is a proper subset of y, which is the case here because there are things in y that are not in x. Um, but it's not the case, for instance, well, if x and y are equal, already, yeah, and it's not true. So equality, as I already said, is, means um, two, uh, two, both sets have exactly the same members. So if x and y are the same, for instance, we have AB and AB, each is a subset of the other, but they are not, they are not proper subsets of each other, and so on. Okay, have you any questions about this? Um, and equality, right, this is there, I already said it earlier. The, uh, so perhaps the important, well, one important fact here is uh, under these things to know that the empty set is a subset of all sets. Okay, the empty set we had here subset of this, for instance. Because the condition for being a subset, all members of the empty set are also members of this, is fulfilled, right? It's vacuously true. There are no members of the empty set. So all members of the empty set are members of, of this. Anyone has a problem with that? No. Yeah. Uh, now. These, like I said, there are statements that can be true or false of two sets. Um, and then there are operations of set on sets which are quite different. They are not statements, but they are ways of producing sets from other sets. So we have, for example, this, the intersection. And as I say on the handout, it's that the set of those objects that are in both x and y. So for example, we can draw these now perhaps like this, x, y, and you have some areas here. Let me call them 2, 3, 4, because there is an area 1 out here, which also, of course, figures in this. So the intersection of x and y is, of course, just Two, oh, three, of course. three in here. The union, next one, is two, three, and four, right? So it's, um, well, let me just, let me put this. This is not, this is not supposed to be a, it's any kind of formal notation, okay? So these three things lump together, right? Um, relative complement, x minus y, this backslash is often used in, philo in the philosophical literature. In the linguistic literature, you often see the minus sign that you're familiar with from, from mathematics and from high school, so, uh, so x minus y. Um, 
is defined in here as the set of things that are in x and not in y. So here, for example, this would just be area 2, right? And then there is uh, the, the complement. So we have the relative complement and the complement relative to, well, the overall set of things, which often is denoted as u, the universe, right? So then we have the complement, how do I write it? With a bar over the x, so x bar is in fact u minus x, that is all the things that are in the universe but not in x. And in this picture, this is 1 and 4, right? 1 plus 4. OK. So we have these things. Operations on sets. Um, any questions about that? Fine. Good. Let's just cruise on. Um, I have some examples here on page 9 just to illustrate these things. But it's... Um, well, I trust that you can go through this on your own. Uh, let's just go on. Further notions, perhaps some of them are, are useful for what we will be talking about. The cardinality of a set written like this is the number of things in that set. Okay, and it's perhaps useful to keep in mind that uh, you have these problems with sets containing sets that you have to keep straight as we are here. So for obviously A has, the set in A here has cardinality three, there are three things in it. The same holds for C. C has, oh, I say four, yeah, actually, wait a minute. Um, C has four things in it, right? Uh, the same holds for B, sorry. B has also three things, right? The fact that A is mentioned twice doesn't matter. But it does matter in C because this set does not contain A twice. It contains the object A and the set containing A. Those are two different things, okay? So that's uh, something we have to be aware of. And then D, even though five different things are mentioned, the set contains only four because one of the members is a set and we don't look inside it and count what's in there, right? So wow, these things, they, well, they, they, they become, I hope, uh, very familiar as you work with these things. Obviously, the empty set has cardinality zero. Not so obviously, perhaps, the set containing the empty set has cardinality one because the empty set is a thing something which is a member of the set. Okay. Right. So the power set, that too will show up both in the readings a lot and also we'll be talking about that. The power set of a set is a set of sets. A set of sets, let's call them X. Now I use uppercase X right now for distinguishing objects and sets. Such that x is a sub, oh, I have x, sorry. That just doesn't work. What did I do on it? Y, such that y is a subset of x, okay, right. So for instance, um, if x is say, uh, our set containing three things, A, B, C, then the power set of it, A, B, C, is the set containing all subsets of this. Now obviously it's clear that A, B, C itself is a subset, right? Remember, it's let, less fewer or the same members. And then we have all the others. We have AB, AC, 
B, C, A, B, C, and not to forget the empty set, which is also a subset, right? So the power set is all these things. It does not have any of the members of this, but it has all the subsets. And as I say here, the cardinality of the power set is 2 to the cardinality of the set itself. I'm not sure if you'll need this fact, but it's good to know in general. Okay. So, um, okay. so in this case, we have 8. If you count them, right? There are 8 things in this power set because we have 3 in x. And that always works. Including for the empty set, the power set of the empty set, perhaps, is the set containing the empty set, which has one member, and you know that two to the zero is one, right? Okay. So this this holds for for all sets. Good. Okay. Uh, slightly deviating from this script. Let's talk about cross products. Any questions so far? Ask. Oh. Okay. Uh, by the way, uh, my plan is here. If we, oh well, there, will be, there won't be much time. In one of the readings, there are exercises on these things. You can go through some of them, perhaps. So it's time. But uh, let's talk about relations first. Um, now here, this thing is also an operator, right? It, it generates, gives us sets when applied to other sets. Uh, and I'm okay. So what what is this? It's again a set of things. So these two are two sets, whatever, two arbitrary sets. And the result of this operation applied to these two sets is a set of pairs. Now it is written like this, uh, let's say A and B, just to avoid using all these axes in different ways. Right? A and B such that A is an X and B is in Y. And now A and B written with these brackets here, these angle brackets, that's something different. That is not the set containing A and B. That is a sequence, as I call it, a sequence or a pair, an ordered pair of two things, um, namely these two objects. So we have to distinguish this from the set containing A and B. Like I said before, for sets, mentioning things several times doesn't make any difference, and reversing the order doesn't make any difference either. But as it says on the handout, A and B is not the same as B A, and is also not the same as A B A. Right? So these things help for sets. Now here we have to think of this as a sequence of things, numbered. So locations here, slots in which these members go. And also AA is not the same as A. All right. Okay, up here we have the so what's called the cross product or the Cartesian product of two sets. And uh, of course we can have sequences of more than two things. And likewise, we can build these Cartesian products of more than two sets, and then we get longer sequences. So if we had a third set, Z, then we could just say that we get this, A, B, C, such that, well, fill in the blanks, A is an X, B is an Y, and so on. We will be talking about binary relations a lot. Those are the ones here with two things, right? Relating two sets. And another important thing is, of course, uh, the 
two sets can be the same, right? So you can have the cross product of x and x, and that is simply the set of pairs of things that are both in x and in x, right? So, well, A is in x, B is in x. Relations are often visualized with arrows. So if you have some set x here, and you have these three things, A, B, C, and say a set y here, and there are these other two things, I have these pictures, in fact, here, and I want to use the same, 0 and 1. Then we can draw these arrows. So first of all, the cross product of these is a set of pairs, like a0, a1, b0, b1, c0, z1, c1, right? And there are 6. It's two ti 3 times 2, right? Uh, we can also draw these arrows. Uh, so when we can do that for all the possible ways of connecting things, and then we have a picture of the cross product, okay? And a relation between x and y is a subset of the cross product. say that binary relation R is a subset of the cross product so we have perhaps something like R is a subset of X times Y and uh, it may be all of these arrows or just some of them or none because it can be any subset of this Cartesian product so and here on page 10 at the bottom you have one for instance a0 B0, B1, A0, B0, B1, and no arrow coming out of C, but that's okay. So this is a relation between X and Y. And you see the picture at the top of page 11. Um, I also say there are something about the notation, often when we say that two things stand in this relation, uh, for example, a and zero, uh, we could say that a zero, th this sequence is an element of R, but more often we will say a R zero, putting the name of the relation between the two things, which makes a lot of sense because you're already you're familiar with that of course uh, here you already saw um, this for instance right this is a relation between sets and if we write that x is a subset of y that is just the same notation as this a r zero for, for this picture here so that's how it's usually written also in modal logic the, the relations that are used there. <coughs> we can skip this little thing on the number of how many different relations there are between two sets. It depends in a quite simple way on the cardinality of these sets. That's, that's pretty clear. So, right, and when the, so, well, let me say, when, so when we have these two, these two sets here and the relation between them, x is called the domain of the relation, and y is called the range of the relation. And this is just you know, to say where the arrows originate and where they go. And of course, uh, we can have relations, I already said, between sets, or well, between x and x, like here. Uh, this is written in a slightly different way, the way you have it there um, down on page 11. If you want to visualize this, you can draw these arrows um, 
in this way. So you have these members of A, uh, sorry, of X, A, B, and C, and the relation that is in the middle there, A, B, A, A, and C, B, you can write like this, C, B, is it right? Yes. Right. So this is just a way of representing the relation that you have there uh, just over the box on page 11. All right? Any questions about that? No. Okay. Still, all right. And this all generalizes to more than two places in these relations, something which we will not go into. I want to talk about properties of relations, page 12. There is a long list of things. There aren't as many as it well there aren't as many as it seems uh, because you can see a reflexive, non-reflexive, or reflexive, they are all about reflexivity. And you have some about symmetry and some about transitivity. Those you can cluster together and you have just a few basic relations that are important that we will need few basic not relations um, properties of relations. So uh, we have to talk about this a little bit because it will be at the center of the most the most interesting aspects of moral logic. So the first one is serial, right? A relation is serial. And then I have a statement of what it, what it means. Uh, if and only if for all x, there is a y, and so on. Now, I am already here only talking about relations on x, right? x times x between the members of a set and the mem members of the same set. OK, a relation is serial um, if there are no dead ends. Right? If for everything in the set x, there is an arrow going out of it, you can go somewhere. Right? So here this is not serial, for instance, because there is no arrow coming out of b. And that's, that violates the condition. If there were one, we would be fine. So we could have this go here or go somewhere else, whatever. Then it would be serial. It is reflexive if and only if you have loops around all of the members. So the original picture was like this. There was a loop around A, but not the other two. Therefore, this relation is not reflexive. Now, if we were to put the loop there, it, of course, would be the reflexive, but uh, right now it isn't. And this is not irreflexive either, because, as you can see, for a relation to be irreflexive, there must be no such loop. So here's one. This is simply not reflexive, period. That's all we can say. And this is sometimes important to distinguish between non, just you know, not being reflexive and being irreflexive. Those are different things. All right? Likewise, for the next ones, symmetry. Symmetry means that if you have an arrow going one way, there is an arrow coming the other way. So this is obviously not symmetric, because what's required here is that you cannot have this. You must have the corresponding arrow in the other direction. Uh, so here is not. You would have, you would have to add these other ones. And here we have actually um, even four different, well, three ways of not being symmetric. Uh, you can either just be not symmetric, period, or you can have a stronger statement. Not only are you not symmetric, but you are asymmetric. In that case, uh, you never have the other arrow going the other way. Here, this is asymmetric, or is it? Thing. 
No, it's actually not asymmetric, right? Because you have AA and AA over here. You have an arrow going both ways. It's not asymmetric. It's, uh, never forget these, the possibility that you may be connecting the same thing on both sides, right? And then this actually meets the condition of uh, so it fails the condition of asymmetry because there is a pair where we have connections in both ways, A A. Um, Anti-symmetry. How does it differ from asymmetry? Well, so. If you have this picture, one arrow going one way and the other coming back, so you have a pair like this, then you can still be anti You cannot be asymmetric, right? But you can still be anti-symmetric, but only if you have the same thing on both sides. That's what this clause states. The only way to go somewhere and come back is to go in circles, right? You can't, you can't have any loops going through several steps, or you know, back and forth in this picture. I'm not sure how how deeply we can get into the uh, asymmetry, anti-symmetry distinction with regard to relations in the in modal logic. But let's keep this in mind, and um, um, it may turn out important. Let's see. All right, anti-symmetry, asymmetry. I hope these paraphrases are helpful. Okay, I do this on the board a little bit. Let's see, do you have any questions so far? Oh. Then we talk about transitivity. That is when you have well. Suppose you have three elements, A, B, C. You cannot fail transitivity if you have less than three things, actually. But uh, uh, for a relation to be transitive, you cannot have this without also having this. Okay. So any point that you can go to in two steps, you can also go to in one step. There's a direct connection, and it, there's always a shortcut. That's transitivity. Uh, again, we have a distinction between simply not being transitive and, in addition, being intransitive. Intransitive being that you never have this. right? So, okay, so this, as it were, um, to make a relation transitive, you fill in this one connection here. Okay, the next one, Euclidean, is somehow related. Already the two um, statements look pretty similar. For transitivity, we had the following statement for all x, y, z, if x r y and y r z then x r z and that's what I just showed you with a b c right Euclidity for all x y, x, y z if x r y so let's see we have a b c if if you have this arrow and this arrow then you must also have this. And of course, you must also have this, right? Because this applies in both ways. Right. Yeah, that's connecting two 
arrow, the, the, you know, the, the tips of two arrows, they have to be connected always. Okay. This is important for modal logic. Euclidean and transitive relations, they play a special role, and uh, we'll see that. Let's skip the next two, connected and dense. Those are properties that you care about only when you talk about time. And so far, we haven't talked about time as we want right now. Um, and if we need to, we can always get back. So this is for your reference as well. If, we, if you ever want to go back and see what this was, uh, you can. All right, so far, well, if you haven't seen these things before, I guess what it just did was not very helpful, probably, because, so what, right? Now you have all these properties of relations, but what does it do for you? Uh, that's a good question. I, well, I promise you'll see this afternoon. Mm. I don't want to go into these classes of relations that have your equivalence and so on, these orders. Not now, maybe later. Uh, in the remaining five minutes, do you all have this basic, this book, um, or sorry, the paper copied out of this mathematical methods and linguistics book? You all have that? Could you open it? Uh, perhaps, let's see. Page, what do we have on page 36? Oh, sorry, no, let's, let's, skip, let's skip this. Let's go to page for a second. 51. There we have some exercises about relations. And, um, now let's just look at them quickly. Uh, first of all, number four, in fact. Let's, let's look at number four on the, on the next page. It often turns out that when you have a relation that has, say, two properties, then it must, must also have some third property. For example, any relation that is um, or, wait a minute. And you said uh, asymmetric and transitive must be reflex or reflexive, things like that. Um, and here is an attempt at proving something. It's quite instructive to see why it fails. So what is wrong with this reasoning that reflexivity is a consequence of symmetry and transitivity? So the idea is, you know, someone might, by the way, uh, Burkhoff and McLean, they didn't make this claim. They use it as an illustration for something that's bad. Okay. You know, so claims, this is a kind of claim that you can make basically saying if R is transitive and what was it, symmetric, then it must also be reflexive transitive and symmetric, then R is reflexive. Okay. And so this purported proof goes like this. If X and Y are in, <coughs> are in the relation, then Y and X are in there, obviously, by symmetry, right? So if x are y, then y are x by symmetry. And if both x are y and y are x, then x are x by transitivity. That's obvious, right? What's wrong with it? See that? The 
problem here is that it started with a conditional and we haven't made sure that the premise of this conditional is actually true. Right? Uh, it is true here, um, it is true, let's say, again, our, let's, let's stay with our three things, A, B, C, that if you have an arrow going out of A anywhere, say to B, then you must have a loop around A, and you must have this as well. Okay? And even now you have this arrow going out of B and coming back, so you must have this as well by, by uh, transitivity. But this relation, as it stands, is transitive and symmetric, but not reflexive. Do you see that? It's transitive and symmetric because for these properties, the um, definition, the membership condition in this class of relations works by universal quantification over arrows, right? It says, if you have something going out, then you must have something coming back. But C fulfills that condition because it has nothing going on. Likewise, for transitivity, if you have two links, then they must be linked up uh, this way, right? You have to add in the shortcut. We did that for all of the cases in question. So this is transitive and symmetric, but it's not reflexive because reflexivity requires that you have loops everywhere. That's why the reasoning was faulty now it is reflexive, but this is not required. It's always, with these, with these properties of relations, it's the easiest pitfall, you know, the easiest problem to run into. Forgetting about these things, the uh, vacuous truth of these quantificational conditions. They all, except for reflexivity, they're all quantifying universally over things. Is that actually true? No, connected is, uh, the connectivity is also uh, a bit different. Um, they're all of this conditional form, the other ones, transitivity and so on. So remember that, you know, is that a relation like this, A, B, C, this is also transitive. Right? It's also symmetric, all that. Um, and the other one is forgetting that you might have the same thing on both sides of these. You know, when, you, when the clause mentions x, y, and so on, you might forget that a, r, a is an instance of that in any, when you apply this to any particular given relation. Oh, actually, yes, we have 15 more minutes. I was rushing. I thought we had to stop. Oh, we have 15 more minutes. That's good. Uh, okay, the um, exercise there in one, well, we can talk about this. I actually don't know the solutions, but the book has solutions in the back, so I will see them. Now. I hope. Um, applying, so we're going to filling these things with life a little bit, these notions, by applying these relations to real life circumstances. Chapter is this chapter three. This gives only one solution to, to the second one. Um, well, actually, so the second one in this exercise one, so is a brother of x r y. Say, you know, let's just define this relation so that x, r, y, if, uh, by the way, I have started using this iff without saying what it means. It means if and only if. If you haven't encountered this before, I'm, I apologize, I should have said it, but you may have seen it before. Quite, quite common. 
um, x r y if and only if x is a brother of y. So I want to, what, what properties does this relation have? Is it reflexive? Someone say something. No. No. Right? No. No one is a brother of him or herself. Right. Symmetry. If x is a brother of y, does it mean that y is a brother of x? Yes? Who says yes? Everyone say yes. No, why not? Yes, of course it can be a, a brother of a woman. And then that woman is not your brother, right? She's your sister, unless it changes her mind. Um, is it descendant? Well, uh, yeah, transitive. Is it transitive, actually? So you are, if x is a brother of y and y is a brother of z, is x a brother of z? No, why not? Uh, why shouldn't it be transitive? I think it is. But I want to look in the solutions. I don't. I'll see it. <laughs> um, what they say. Don't find it. But it's. This is good. This is, yeah, I, I knew there was something. Now, if you think again, <laughs> right? Mm. Uh, suppose you have three people, A, B, and C, okay, and they are all brothers, all three. Um, now you can say A is a brother of B. We also know that B is a brother of A. And by transitivity, we would have that A is a brother of A. And that's not the case, right? Uh, I'm glad I looked this up. Yes. Again, so you know you have to be careful. These things you have to have to uh, consider the possibility of having the same element on both sides. Right, and it's a child of. This is rather uninteresting. Right, it's not it's not symmetric and not reflexive. It's also not transitive. Right, because the children of your child are your grandchildren, not your children. Right. They also say, what would happen if we, um, in, in D, what would happen if we were to restrict everything to male people, to men? Well, then the brother of relation would change, right? Because, as we said before, it's not symmetric because your sister is not your brother. Or, right. But look, uh, if, if we only restrict the relation to the set of male people, then the brother of relation is symmetric. Because then you can only be the brother of a man who is then your brother. Okay. So, well, yeah, this leaves us, and we can do some more of this later. Um, talking about functions, just to wrap up this part of the technical introduction. So like I said, now we talked about relations. If you have seen this before, it was boring. If you haven't, you don't know right now exactly what these things will be good for. But you will, I hope. So let's 
go on. A function is also a relation. That's very simple. Functions are relations. With one special property. So again, looking at this A, B, C, 0, 1, uh, we have X and Y. <coughs> And we had, I believe, that we had A going here, this, and this, right? This is a relation, but it is not a function. Um, a function from x to y must meet at least one more criterion, and some would say two. It depends a little bit on your on the way you use these terms. What, what's most most wrong with this is the fact that you have two arrows coming out of B. Okay, that's that violates the basic definition of a function. Um, so now for relations, I used R. For functions, we can use F. So so um, if x at f z and um, x, f, y, then y equals z. This has to be the case for it to be a function, right? So from the same element, x, you cannot go to, do, to two distinct elements on the other side. You can only go to the same thing twice. That, of course, you can do, right? Because you are just a set of pairs. Um, so for every first member, there can be no more than one entry, as it were, you know, one arrow. So one of them has to go. Now, um, in a sense, it is a function, but it is still a partial function. So this is the other distinction we have to make between partial functions and total functions. A total function is one where you have for every member of the domain something, you know, an arrow going somewhere. Okay. So if we were to add something here, just like this, this is now a total function. It doesn't matter that we com come together here, that we converge on one on this side. We must not branch over here. That's the problem with the with this clause. So total function and partial function. The difference there is just whether or not you cover all the things in your domain. If you have uh, an, you know, an arrow coming out of everything, then you are a total function. So sometimes in the literature, people um, use function to mean total function. And if they, uh, you know, want to talk about partial functions, they say so. So the default, as it were, or the unmarked case is total function. Otherwise, you wouldn't call it a function. Uh, there is, so there is this other way of writing it, of course, which you are familiar from mathematics, and so my f of x equals z, right? We can do that because we are guaranteed that there will be at most one z on the other side, right? So if f of x is z and f of x is y, then y equals z. That's just a different way of writing this, right? It just can't, it has to be unique, right? If you have something, if you have, if you have something, it has to be unique. This is sometimes called the argument and this the value of the function, right? Um, yeah. And often you see this notation. Uh, you have a function f from x to y. In definitions, you may see this. But it really is it's just a, a different way of writing that f is a subset of the Cartesian product of x and y, 
which satisfies this condition and is perhaps a total function if you use it in, in that way. Yeah. Uh, okay, so of, uh, sometimes you may also see uh, that f is a member of a set which would then be written like this this power notation y to the x this is used to denote the set of all functions from x to y uh, this is some, some people find this annoying this notation because it sort of is unintuitive there is just one interesting one, one nice fact about it if you want to know how many functions there are from x to y, then you just y, sorry, x. You just do this. Maybe that's why there is this notation right here. Because number of functions in fact this. So we have two to the three, that should be eight functions from x to y. I think that's true. You can write them out if you if you um, care. Uh, all right. Any questions now at this point? It's nice. So it's twelve fifteen. We finished this. The next hour now we'll meet again at two. Is that right? At two, we will talk briefly, very briefly, about propositional logic. The, um, and we'll move quickly on to um, the, the most interesting topic, namely model logic and models for model logic. And the way in which these properties of relations turn out to be very basic, very central to the to everything model logicians do in their work. Okay, so I'll see you again at two then. Thanks. Okay, should we start? Thanks for coming back. Um, so, okay, the last thing we did was we talked about sets, relations, and functions. Was I too fast? Too slow? Tell me, you have to tell me. I don't know really. So, we will just move on and in the remaining two hours of this day talk about the language of propositional logic and the language of propositional modal logic. As I said this morning, we may not be able to go much into first order modal logic, and we may not have to, because the remaining readings tomorrow and on Sunday will mostly deal with the propositional case. Okay. So, section four on this handout, page 14, let me get rid of this. So, we are talking about propositional logic, propositional Logic. Why do we do that? What is it? Uh, I think most of you, probably all, have encountered it at some point. This language is an artificial language, which is extremely simple and neat, unlike natural languages. And even though our goal ultimately is to analyze